The Manifesto of the Communist Party, written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Introduction. A specter is hounding Europe, the specter of communism. All the powers of old Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exercise the specter. Pip and Tsar Metternich and Gossop, French radicals and German police base. Where is the party in opposition has not been decried as communistic by its opponents in power? Or is the opposition that has not hurled back the branding reproach of communism against the more advanced opposition parties as well as against its reactionary adversaries? Two things result from this fact. One, communism is already acknowledged by all European powers to be itself a power. Two, it is high time that communists should openly in the face of the whole world publish their views, their aims, their tendencies, and meet this nursery tall of the specter of communism with a manifesto of the party itself. To this end, communists of various nationalities have assembled in London and sketched the following manifesto to be published in the English, French, German, Italian, Flemish, and Danish languages. Chapter 1, Bourgeois and Proletarians. The history of all other existing societies, the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, and a word oppressor and oppressed due to constant opposition to one another. Carried on in an interrupted now in an open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of South City at large or in the common reign of the contending classes. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of South City into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves, in the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, yarnmen, apprentices, serfs, and almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. The modern bourgeois South City that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal South City has not done with class antagonism. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of old ones. Our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinct feature that he has simplified class and agonism. So city as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other. Bourgeoisie and proletariat. From the serfs of the Middle Ages sprang the chartered borgers of the Arles towns. From these burgesses, the first elements of the bourgeoisie were developed. The discovery of America, the rounding of the Cape of Pen, up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie. The East Indian and Chinese markets, the colonization of America, trade with the colonies, the increase in the means of exchange and in commodities generally, get to commerce, to navigation, the industry and impulse never before known, and there be the revolutionary element in the tottering field of city, a rapid development. The feudal system of industry, in which industrial production was monopolized by closed goals, now no longer sufficed for the growing wants of the new markets. The manufacturing system took its place. The guild masters were pushed on one side by the manufacturing middle class division of labor between the different corporate guilds vanished in the face of division of labor in each single workshop. In time, the markets kept ever growing, the demand ever rising. Even manufacturer no longer sufficed the upon. Steam and machinery revolutionized industrial production. The place of manufacture was taken by the giant motor industry, the place of the industrial middle class by industrial millionaires, the leaders of the whole industrial armies, the modern bourgeois. The motor industry has established the world market for the discovery of America paved the way. This market has given an immense development to commerce, to navigation, to communication by land. This development has, in its turn, wreaked it on the extension of industry. And in proportion as industry, commerce, navigation, railways extended, in the same proportion the bourgeoisie developed, increased its capital, and pushed into the background of every class handed down from the Middle Ages. We see, therefore, how the modern bourgeoisie is itself a product of a long course of development of a series of revolutions in the modes of production and of exchange. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class. An oppressed class under the sway of the feudal nobility, an armed and self-governing association in the medieval coming in here, independent Roman Republic, is in Italy and Germany. They're taxable, they're the state of the monarchy, as in France. Afterwards, in the period of manufacturing proper, serving either the semi-feudal or the absolute monarchy as a counterpoise against the nobility, and in fact, cornerstone of the great monarchies in general, the bourgeoisie is at last. Since the establishment of modern industry and of the world market conquered for itself in the modern representative state, exclusive political sway, the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie.
historically has played a most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put into all fetal patriarchal idyllic relations. It has pitilessly turned its under the moly feudal teeth that bow men to his natural superiors, and has left remaining no other nexus between men and men that make self interest and call us cash payment. It has drawn the most evenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of philistine sentimentalism, in the sea water of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal worth into exchange volume, and, and place of a numberless and defeasible charge freedoms, has set up that single, unconscionable freedom, free trade, in one word for exploitation, veiled by religious and political illusions, it has substituted nay, shameless, to direct, brutal exploitation. The bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation, and for 200 and looked up to with Reverend L. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the press, the poet, the man of saints into its paid wage love hours. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil, and has reduced the family relation to a mere money relation. The bourgeoisie has disclosed how it came to pass that the brutal display of Igar in the Middle Ages, which Rectionary so much admire, found its fitting complement and the most loveful indolence. It has been the first to show what men's activity can bring about. It has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts, and Gothic cathedrals. It has conducted expeditions that put in the shade all former exodus of nations in Christendom. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production, and thereby the relations of production, and within the whole relations of society. Conservation of the old modes of production in an altered form was, on the contrary, the first condition of existence for all the earlier industrial classes. Constant revolutionizing of production, when interrupted instruments of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois pots from all the earlier ones. All facts, vast frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new forms become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into our, all that is holy is profane, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. The bourgeoisie has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. To the great chagrin of regionist, it's drowned from under the feet of industry of the national ground, which it still. All established national industries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed. They are dislodged during the industries. How's introduction becomes a life and death question for all civilized nations by industries that no longer work up indigenous raw material, but raw material drawn from the realm of the suns. Industries whose products are constant, not only at home, but in every quarter of the globe. In place of the old wants, satisfied by the production of the country, we find new wants requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes. In place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have intercourse in every direction, a never so interdependence of nations. And as in material soul, so in intellectual production, the intellectual creations of individual nations become common property. National unsettedness and narrow minds become more and more impossible, and from the numerous national and local literatures, there are as is a world literature, the bourgeoisie, by the rapid improv of all instruments of production, by the immensely facilitated means of communication, grows all, even the most barbarian, nations into civilization. It ship prices of commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all chance walls, with which it forces the barbarians intensely obstinate beggar to foreigners to capitulate. It compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois and mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst act, to become bourgeois themselves. In one word, it creates a world after its own image. The bourgeoisie has subjected the country to the rule of the towns. It has created enormous cities, has greatly increased their man population as compared with the rural, and has thus rescued a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life. Just as it has made the country dependent on the towns, so it has made barbarian and semi-barbarian countries dependent on the civilized honest nations of peasants, on nations of bourgeois, the est on the west. The bourgeoisie keeps more and more doing away with the scattered state of the population of the means of production and of property.
It has agglomerated population, centralized the means of production, and has concentrated property in a few hands. A necessary consequence of this was political centralization. Independent, are but loosely connected provinces with separate and riskless governments and systems of taxation became lumped together into one nation with one government, one code of laws, one national class interest, one frontier, and one customs tariff. The bourgeoisie during its rule of scarce 100 years has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. Subjection of nature's forces to man machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraphs, clearing of whole continents for cultivation. Canalization of rivers, whole populations conjured out of the ground. What earlier century had even presentiment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social lobar. We see that the means of production and of exchange on whose foundation the bourgeoisie built itself up were generated in feudal society. At a certain stage in the development of these means of production and of exchange, the conditions under which feudal society produced and exchange, the feudal organization of agriculture, manufacturing industry, on word the feudal relations of property became no longer compatible with the already developed productive forces. They became so many fetters. They had to be burst asunder. They were burst asunder into their place step free competition accompanied by social and political constitution adapted in it in the economic and political sway of the bourgeois class a similar movement is going on before our own eyes modern bourgeois society with its relations of production of exchange and of property a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of another world whom he has called up by his spells for many a decade past the history of industry and commerce is but the history of the revolt of modern productive forces against modern conditions of production. Against the property relations that air the conditions for the existence of the bourgeois and of its rule. It is you now to mention the commercial crisis that by their periodical return put the existence of the entire bourgeois society on its trawl each time more freedomingly. In this crisis, a great part not only of the existing products, but also the previously created productive forces are periodically destroyed. In this crisis, there breaks out an epidemic. In all the earlier epochs, would have seemed an absurdity. The epidemic of overproduction. So city suddenly finds itself put back into the state of momentary barbarism. It appears as if a famine, an universal war of devastation, had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seem to be destroyed, and why? Because there is too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. The productive forces at the disposal of society no longer tend to further the development of the conditions of bourgeois property. On the contrary, they have become too powerful for these conditions by which they are fettered. And so soon as they overcome these fetters, they bring disorder into the whole of bourgeois society, endanger the existence of bourgeois property. The conditions of bourgeois society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of the mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevalent. The weapons with which the bourgeoisie fold feudalism to the ground are now turned against the bourgeoisie itself. But not only has the bourgeoisie forged the weapons that bring beef to itself, it has also called into existence men who are to wield those weapons, the modern working class, the proletarians, in proportion as the bourgeoisie, I, capital, is developed in the same proportion as the proletariat, the modern working class. Developed a class of laborers who live only so long as they find work and who find work only so long as their labor increases capital. These laborers who must sell themselves piecemeal are, are a commodity like every other article of commerce and are consequently exposed to all the vicissitudes of competition, all the fluctuations of the market. Owing to the extensive use of machinery and to the division of labor, the work of the proletarians has lost all individual character and consequently all charm for the workman. He becomes an appendage of the matchin, and it is only the most simple, most monotonous, and most easily accurate neck that is recurrent of him. Hence, the cost of production of a workman is restricted almost entirely to the means of subsistence that he requires for maintenance and for the propagation of his race. 
But the price of a commodity and therefore also is low bar. Is equal to its cost of production. In proportion, therefore, as the repulsiveness of the work increases, the wage decreases. Nay more, in proportion as these of machinery and division of labor increases, in the same proportion the burden of tolls increases. Whether by prolongation of the working hours, by the increase of the work exacted in a given time, or by increased speed of machinery, etc. Modern industry has converted the little workshop of the patriarchal master into the great factory of the industrial capitalist. Masses of laborers crowded into the factory are organized like soldiers. As privates of the industrial army, they are placed under the common of a perfect hierarchy of officers and sergeants. Not only are they slaves of the bourgeois class and of the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the mansion, by the overlooker, and above all by the individual bourgeois manufacturer himself. The more openly this despotist proclaims him to be its end and aim, the more petty, the more hateful, and the more embittering it is. The less the skill and exertion of strength implied in man or labor, in other words, the more modern industry becomes developed. The more is the labor meant superseded by that of woman. Differences of age and sex have no longer any distinctive social validity for the working class. All are instruments of labor, more or less expensive to use according to their age and sex. No sooner is the exploitation of the labor by the manufacturer so far, and in that he receives his wage and cash. Then he is set upon by the other portions of the bourgeoisie, the landlord, the shipkeeper, the pawnbroker, etc. The lower strata of the middle class, the small tradespeople, people, shipkeepers, and rented tradesmen generally, the handicraftsmen and peasants, all these sink regularly into the proletariat, already because their diminutive capital does not suffice for the stall on which modern industry is carried on. And is swamped in the competition with the large capitalists partly because their specialized skill is rendered worthless by new methods of production. Thus the proletariat is recruited from all classes of the population. The proletariat goes through various stages of development. With its birth begins its struggle with the bourgeoisie. At first the contest is carried on by individual bars, then by the war people of a factory, then by the operative of one trade in one locality, against the individual bourgeois who directly exploits them. They direct their attacks not against the bourgeois conditions of production, but against the instruments of production themselves. They destroy imported wars that compete with their labor. They smash to pieces machinery. They set factories ablaze. They seek to restore by force the vanished stages of the workmen of the Middle Ages. At this stage, the little bars still form an incoherent mass scattered over the whole country and broken up by their mutual competition. Even who are they enact to form more compact bodies? This is not yet the consequence of their own active union, but of the union of the bourgeoisie. Which class, in order to attain its own political ends, is compelled to set the whole proletariat in motion, and is moreovery for a time able to do so. At this stage, the reform, the proletarians do not fight their enemies, but the enemies of their enemies, the remnants of absolute monarchy, the landowners, the non-industrial bourgeois, the petty bourgeois. Thus, the whole historical movement is concentrated in the hands of the bourgeoisie. Every victory so obtained is a victory for the bourgeoisie. But with the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, it becomes concentrated in greater masses, its strength grows, and it feels that strength more. The various interests and conditions of life with the ranks of the proletariat are more and more equalized in proportion as machinery obliterates all distinctions of low bar. And nearly everywhere reduces wages to the same low level. The growing competition among the bourgeois and the resulting commercial crisis make the wages of the workers ever more fluctuating. The increasing improvement of machinery, ever more rapidly developing, makes their levels more and more precarious. The collisions between individual workmen and individual bourgeois take more and more of the character of collisions between two classes. Thereupon, the workers begin to form combinations, trades unions against the bourgeois. They club together in order to keep up the rate of wage. They found permanent associations in order to make revision beforehand for these occasional revolts. Here and there, the condition breaks out into routes. Now all the workers are victorious, but only for a time. The real threat of their battles lies not in the immediate result, but the ever-expanding union of the workers. This union is helped on by the improved means of communication that are created in modern industry, and that place the workers of different localities in contact with one another. It was just this contact that was needed to centralize the numerous local struggles, all of the same character, into one national struggle between classes. But every class struggle is a political struggle.
and that union to attain which the borgers of the Middle Ages with their miserable highways record centuries. The modern proletarian, thanks to railways, achieve in a few years. This organization of the proletarians into a class and consequently into a political party is continually being upset again by the competition between the workers themselves. But it ever rises up again, stronger, firmer, mightier. It compels legislative recognition of particular interests of the workers by taking advantage of the divisions among the bourgeoisie itself. This the Ten Hours Bill in England was carried. Altogether collisions between the classes of the old South City further in many ways the course of development of the proletariat. The bourgeoisie finds itself involved in a constant battle. At first with the aristocracy, later on those portions of the bourgeoisie itself, whose interests have become antagonistic to the progress of industry, all time with the bourgeoisie of foreign countries. In all these battles, it sees itself compelled to appeal to the proletariat to ask for help, and thus to drag it into the political irony. The bourgeoisie itself, therefore, supplies the proletariat with its own elements of political and general education. In other words, it furnishes the proletariat with weapons to fight in the bourgeoisie. Over. As we have already seen, intersections of the rolling class are by the advance of industry precipitated into the proletariat, or are at least threatened in their conditions of existence. These also supply the proletariat with fresh elements of enlightenment and progress. Finally, in times when the class struggle nears the decisive hard, the progress of dissolution going on with the ruling class, in fact, within the whole range of old South City, assumes such a violent law ring character that a small section of the ruling class cuts itself adrift and joins the revolutionary class, the class that holds the future in its hands. Just as, therefore, in an earlier period, a section of the nobility went over to the bourgeoisie, so no, a portion of the bourgeoisie goes goes over to the proletariat, and in particular, a portion of the bourgeois ideologists will have raised themselves to the level of comprehending theoretically the historical movement as a whole. Of all the classes that stand face to face with the bourgeoisie today, the proletariat alone is a really revolutionary class. The other classes decay and finally disappear in the face of modern industry. The proletariat is its special and essential product. The lower middle class, the small manufacturer, the shopkeeper, the artisan, the peasant, all these fight against the bourgeoisie to save from extinction their existence as fractions of the middle class. They are therefore not revolutionary but conservative. Any more, they are reactionary, for they try to roll back the wheel of history. By chance, they are revolutionary. They are only so in view of their impending transfer into the proletariat. They thus defend not their present but their future interests. They desert their own standpoint to place themselves at that of the proletariat. The dangerous class, the social scum, that passively rotting mass thrown off by the lost layers of the old South City may here and there be swept into the movement by a proletarian revolution. Its conditions of life, however, prepare it far more for the part of a bribe until of reactionary and triggered. In the condition of the proletariat, those of old South City at large are already virtually swamped. The proletarian is without property. His relation to his wife and children has no longer anything in common with the bourgeois family relations. The modern industrial of our modern subjection to capital, the same in England as in France, in America is in Germany, that stripped him of every trace of national character. Uh, morality, religion, are to him so many bourgeois prejudices by which work and invest just as many bourgeois interests. All the preceding classes that got the upper hand sought to fortify their already accord states by subjecting society at large to their conditions of appropriation. The proletarians cannot become masters of the productive forces of South City, except by abolishing their own previous mode of appropriation, and their boss of every other previous mode of appropriation. They have nothing of their own security to fortify. Their mission is to destroy previous securities for insurances of individual property. All previous historical movements were movements of minorities, or in the interest of minorities. The proletarian movement is the self anxious independent movement of the immense majority, in the interest of the immense majority. The proletariat, the lowest stratum of our present society, cannot stir, cannot raise itself up, without the whole superincumbent strata of official society being sprung into the air. They're not in substance, it informed the struggle of the proletariat with the bourgeoisie is at first a national struggle. The proletariat of each country must, of course, first of all settle matters with its own bourgeoisie. In depicting the most general faces of the development of the proletariat, we trace the more or less veal civil war, raging within existing society, up to the point where that war breaks out into open revolution, and where the violent overthrow of the bourgeoisie lays the foundation for the sway of the proletariat. 
Every form of society has been based, as we have already seen, on the antagonism of oppressing and oppressed classes. But in order to oppress a class, certain conditions must be asserted under which it can at least continue its slavish existence. The serf and the parent of serfdom raised himself to membership in the commons just as the petty bourgeois, under the yoke of the feeble absolutist, managed to develop into bourgeois. The modern labor, on the contrary, instead of rising with the process of industry, sinks deeper and deeper below the conditions of existence of his own class. He becomes a pauper, and pauperism develops more rapidly than population and wealth. And here it becomes evident that the bourgeoisie is unfit any longer to be the ruling class in South City and to impose its conditions of existence upon South City as an overrating law. It is unfit to rule because it is incompetent to assure an existence to its slave within his slavery because it cannot help letting him sink into such a state that it has to feed him instead of being fed by him. So city can no longer live under this bourgeoisie. In other words, its existence is no longer compatible with such city. The essential conditions for the existence and for the sway of the bourgeois class is the formation and augmentation of capital. The condition for capital is wage labor. Wage labor rests exclusively on competition between the laborers. The advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by the revolutionary combination due to association. The development of motor industry, therefore, cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which the bourgeoisie produces and appropriates products. What the bourgeoisie, therefore, produces, above all, are its own grave diggers. It's followed, and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. Chapter 2, Proletarians and Communists. In what relation do the communists stand to the proletarians as a whole? The communists do not form a separate party opposed to the other working class parties. They have no interest to separate and apart from those of the proletariat as a whole. They do not set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. The communists are distinguished from the other working class parties by this only on in the national struggles of the proletarians of the different countries. They point out and bring to the front the common interest of the entire proletariat independently of all nationality. To the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeoisie has to pass through, they always and everywhere present the interest of the movement as a whole. The communists, therefore, are on the one hand practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of every country, that section which pushes for real others. On the other hand, theoretically, they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, the conditions, and the ultimate general results of the proletarian movement. The immediate aim of the commons is the same as that of all other proletarian parties formation of the proletariat in a class of overthrow the bourgeois supremacy conquest of political power by the proletariat. The theoretical conclusions of the communists are in no way based on ideas or principles that have been invented or discovered by this or that would be a universal reformer. They may express in general terms actual relations springing from an existing class struggle, from a historical movement going on under our very eyes. The abolition of existing property relations is not at all a distinctive feature of common. All property relations in the past have continually been subject to historical change consequent upon the change in historical conditions. The French Revolution, for example, abolished feudal property in favor of bourgeois property. The distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. That modern bourgeois private property is the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and appropriating products that is based on class antagonisms on the exploitation of the many by the few. This sense, the theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence of the abolition of private property. We communists have been reproached with the desire of abolishing the right of personality acquiring property as the fraud of a man's own labor, which property is all to be the groundwork of all personal freedom, activity, and independence. Part 1, self-acquired, self-earned property, human the property of petty artisan and the small peasant, a form of property that preceded the bourgeois form. There is no need to abolish it. The development of industry has to a great extent already destroyed it and is still destroying it daily. Or do you mean the modern bourgeois private property? Does wage law or create any property for the low bar? Not a bit. It creates capital, I, the kind of property which exploits wage law bar and which cannot increase except upon condition of beginning a new supply of wage law bar for fresh exploitation. Property in its present form is based on the antagonism of capital and wage law bar.
Let us examine both sides of this antagonism. To be a capitalist is to have not only a purely personal, but a social status in production. Capital is a collective production. And only by the united action of many members, nay, in the last resort, only by the united action of all members of society can it be set in motion. Capital is therefore not only personal, it is a social power. And therefore, capital is converted into common property, into the property of all members of society. Personal property is not thereby transformed into social property. It is only the social character of the property that is changed. It loses its class character. Let us now take wage low bar. The average price of wage low bar is the minimum wage. I that quantum of the means of subsistence, which is absolutely requisite to keep a low bar in bar existence as a low bar roof. But therefore, the wage low bar appropriates by means of his low bar. Merely suffices to prolong and reproduce a bare existence. We by no means intend to abolish this personal appropriation of the products of labor and the appropriation that is made for the maintenance and reproduction of human life, and that leaves no surplus wherewith to commend the labor of others. All that we want to do all we with is the miserable character of this appropriation, under which the labor lives merely to increase capital, and is all of the live only and suffer as the interest of the ruling class requires it. In Borsha society, living a labor is but a means to increase accumulated labor. In communist society, accumulated labor is but a means to widen and to enrich, to promote the existence of the labor. In bourgeois society, therefore, the past dominates the present. In communist society, the present dominates the past. In bourgeois society, capital is independent and has individuality, while the living person is dependent and has no individuality. And the abolition of the state of things is called by the bourgeois abolition of individuality and freedom, and rightly so. The abolition of bourgeois individuality, bourgeois independence, and bourgeois freedom is undoubtedly on that freedom is made under the present bourgeois conditions of production, free trade, free selling and buying. But if selling and buying disappears, free selling and buying disappears also. This talk about free selling and buying and all the other brave words of our bourgeois about freedom in general have a meaning of any, only in contrast with restricted selling and buying with the fettered traders of the Middle Ages, but have no meaning when opposed to the communistic abolition of buying and selling of the bourgeois conditions of production and of the bourgeoisie itself. You are horrified at our intending to do away with private property. But in your existing society, private property is already gone over for nine-tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine-tenths. You reproach us, therefore, with intending to do away with a form of property, the necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In one word, you reproach us with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so. That is just what we intend. From the moment when labor can no longer be converted into capital, money or rent, into social power capable of being monopolized, from the moment when individual property can no longer be transformed into bourgeois property, into capital from that moment, you say individuality vanishes. You must therefore confess that by individual you mean no other person than the bourgeois, than the middle class owner of property. This person must indeed be swept out of the way and made impossible. Communism deprives the man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive him of the power to subject the labor of others by means of such appropriations. It has been objected that upon the abolition of private property, all work will cease and universal laziness will overtake us. According to this, bourgeois society ought long ago have gone to dogs through sheer illness for those of its members who work accord nothing and those who accord anything do not work. The whole of this objection is but another expression of the tautology that there can no longer be any wage labor when there is no longer any capital. All objections urged against the communistic mode of producing and appropriating material products have in the same way been urged against the communistic mode of producing and appropriating intellectual products. Just as the bourgeois, the disappearance of class property is the disappearance of production itself, so the disappearance of class culture is to him identical with the disappearance of all culture. That culture, the loss of which he laments, is for the enormous majority a mere training to act as a mansion. But don't wrangle with us so long as you apply to our intended abolition of bourgeois property, the standard of your bourgeois notions of freedom, culture, low. Your very ideas are but the outgrowth of the conditions of your bourgeois production and bourgeois property, just as your jurisprudence is but the will of your class men and a love for all. 
uh, what was essential character and direction are determined by the economical conditions of existence of your class. The selfish misconception that induces you to transform into eternal laws of nature and of reason. The social forms springing from your present mode of production and form a property of historical relations that rise and disappear in the progress of production. This misconception you share with every ruling class that has preceded you. What you see clearly in the case of ancient property, what you admit in the case of feudal property, you are, of course, forbidden to admit in the case of your own bourgeois form of property. Abolition of the family, even the most radical flare of this infamous proposal of the commons. On what foundation is the present family, the bourgeois family, based in capital on private gain, in its completely developed form? This family exists only among the bourgeoisie, but this state of things finds its complement in the practical absence of the family among the proletarians and public prostitution. The bourgeois family will vanish as a major, of course, when its complement vanishes, and both will vanish with the vanishing of capital. Do you charge us with wanting to stop the exploitation of children by their parents? To this crime we play guilty. But do you say we destroy the most hollow of relations when we replace home education by social? And your education is not that also social and determined by the social conditions under which you educate, by the intervention, direct or indirect, of society by means of schools. The communists have not invented the intervention of South City in education. They did but seek to alter the character of that intervention and to rescue education from the influence of the ruling class. The Boers would claptrap about the family and education, about the holodka relation of parents and children, becomes all the more disgusting, the more by the action of modern industry. All the family keys M and the proletarians are torn as gender and their children transformed into simple articles of commerce and, and instruments of labor. That you communists would introduce community of women, screams the bourgeoisie in Charis. The bourgeoisie his wife, a mere instrument of production. He hears that the instruments of production are de-exploited in common, and naturally can come to no other conclusion that the lot of being common to all will likewise fall to the women. He has not even a suspicion that the real point of it is to do away with the stages of women as mere instruments of production. For the rest, nothing is more ridiculous than the virtuous indignation of our bourgeois, the community of women, which they pretend to be openly and officially established by the communists. The communists have no need to introduce community of women. It has existed almost from time immemorial. Our bourgeois, not content with having wives and daughters of their proletarians at their disposal, not speak of common prostitutes, take the greatest pleasure in seducing each other's wives. Bourgeois marriage is, in reality, a system of lives in common, and this at the most. What the communists might possibly be reproached with is that they desire to introduce in substitution for a hypocritically concealed an openly legalized community of women. Before the rest, it is self-evident that the abolition of the present system of production must bring with it the abolition of the community of women springing from that system of uh, prostitution both public and private. The communists are further reproached with desiring to abolish countries and nationality. The working men have no country. We cannot take from them what they have not got. Since the proletariat must first of all act our political supremacy, must rise to be the leading class of the nation, must constitute itself a nation, it is so far self-national, though not in the bourgeois sense of the word. National differences and antagonism between peoples are daily more and more vanishing, owing to the development of the bourgeoisie, to freedom of commerce, to the world market uniformity in the mode of production and in the conditions of life corresponding very the supremacy of the proletariat will cause them to vanish still faster. An added action of the leading civilized countries, at least, is one of the first conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. In proportion as the exploitation of one individual by another will also be put an end to the exploitation of one nation by another will also be put an end. In proportion as the antagonism between classes within the nation vanishes, the hostility of one nation to another will come to an end. The charges against commons made from a religious, philosophical, and general eye from an ideological standpoint are not deserving of serious examination. Visit Ricard Deep in Jushin to comprehend that man's at ease, vibes, and conception. In one word, man's consciousness changed with every change in the conditions of his material existence, in his social relations, and his social life. What else does the history of Addis prove than that intellectual production changes its character in proportion as material production is changed? The ruling eddies of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. When people speak of the ideas that revolutionize society, they do but express the fact that within the old society, the elements of a new one have been created. 
and that the dissolution of the old ideas keeps even pace with the dissolution of the old conditions of existence. When the ancient world was in its last throes, the ancient religions were overcome by Christianity. When Christian ideas succumbed in the 18th century to rationalist ideas, civil society fought its death battle with the then revolutionary bourgeoisie. The ideas of religious liberty and freedom of conscience merely gave expression to the sway of free competition within the domain of knowledge. Undoubtedly, it will be said, religious, moral, philosophical, and juridical ideas have been modified in the course of historical development. But religion, morality, philosophy, political science, and law constantly survived this change. There are, besides eternal trusts, such as freedom, justice, and shatery, that are common to all states of society. But communism abolishes eternal truths, it abolishes all religion and all morality instead of constituting them on a new basis. It therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experience. What does this accusation reduce itself to? The history of all past South City has consisted in the development of class antagonisms, antagonisms that assume different forms at different epochs. But whatever form they may have taken, one fact is common to all past ages. As the exploitation of one part of society by the other. No wonder then that the social consciousness of past ages, despite all the multiplicity and verity it displays, moves within certain common forms or general ideas which cannot completely vanish except with the total disappearance of class antagonisms. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional property relations. No wonder that its development involved the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. But let us have done with the bourgeois objections to communism. We have seen above that the first tip in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state. I of the proletariat organized is the ruling class and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. Of course, in the beginning, this cannot be effected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of property and on the conditions of bourgeois production, by means of measures, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and unable, but which in the course of the movement outstrip themselves, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order and are inevitable as a means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production. These measures will, of course, be different in different countries. Nevertheless, in most advanced countries, the following will be pretty generally applicable. On abolition of property in line and application of all rents of land to public purposes. To the heavy progressive or graduate income tax. Grand abolition of all rights of inheritance. Poor confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rubles. Five centralization of credit in the hands of the state, the means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Six centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Seven extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wasty lands and the improvement of the soul generally in accordance with a common plan. And equal ability of all the work, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. And a combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of all the distinction between town and country by a more equal distribution of the populace over the country. Tent free education for all children and public schools. Abolition of children's factory lobar in its present form. Combination of education with the industrial production. It's shitter, it's shitter. When in the course of development, class distinctions have disappeared and all production has been concentrated in the hands of a vast association of the whole nation, the public power will lose its political character. Political power, properly so called, is merely the organized power of all class for oppressing another. If the proletariat during its cons with the bourgeoisie is compelled by the force of circumstances to organize itself as a class, if by means of a revolution it makes itself a ruling class and as such, sweeps away by force the old conditions of production, then it will, along with its conditions, have swept away the conditions for the existence of class antagonism of classes generally and will thereby have abolished its own supremacy as a class. In place of the old wars of society, with its classes and class antagonism, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Chapter 3 Socialist and Communist Literature Part 1. Rationary Socialism and Feudal Socialism.
Owing to their historical position, it became the vocation of the aristocracies of France and England to write pamphlets against modern Boers for subsidy. The French Revolution of Joliet 1830 and in the English Reform Agitation, these aristocracies again succumbed to the hateful upstart. Then so forth. Asheria's political struggle was altogether out of the question. A literary battle alone remained possible. But even in the domain of literature, the old dreams of the Restoration period had become impossible. In order to arouse sympathy, the aristocracy was obliged to lose sight, apparently, of its own interest and to formulate their indictment against the bourgeoisie in the interest of the blood wearing class alone. Thus, the aristocracy took their revenge by singing lampoons on their new masters and whispering in his ear sinister prophecies of common catastrophe. In this way arose fetal socialism, health, lamentation, health, lampoon, health, and issue of the past, health, menace of the future. At times, by its bitter, witty, and incisive criticism, striking the Boers' receipt to the very heart's core, but always ludicrous in its effect of total incapacity to comprehend the march of modern history. The aristocracy, in order to rally the people to them, waved the proletarian alms bag in front for a banner. But the people so often as it joined them so on their hundred as the old feudal coats of arms and deserted with love and irreverent laughter. One section of the French legitimates and human England exhibited the spectacle. In pointing out that their mode of exploitation was different to that of the bourgeoisie, the feudalists forget that they exploited under circumstances and conditions that were quite different and that are now antiquated. In showing that under their rule the modern proletariat never existed, they forget that the modern bourgeoisie is the necessary offspring of their own form of society. For the rest, how little do they conceal the reactionary character of the criticism that their chief accusation against the bourgeois amounts to this. That under the Borsa regime, a class is being developed which is destined to cut up root and branch the old order of South City. What they upgrade the bourgeoisie with is not so much that it creates a proletariat as that it creates a revolutionary proletariat. In political practice, therefore, they join in all coarse measures against the working class. And in ordinary life, despite their high phylogen phrases, they stood to pick up the golden apples dropping from the tree of industry and the barter troth of honor for traffic in wool, bitrate, sugar, and potato spirits. As the parson has ever gone hand in hand with the landlord, so has clerical socialism with feudal socialism. Nothing is easier than to give Christian asceticism of socialist in is not Christianity to claim against private property, against marriage, against the state. Is it not preach in the place of this charity and poverty, celibacy and mortification of the flesh, monastic life and mother church? Christian socialism is but the holy water with which the priest consecrates the heart burnings of the aristocrat. The petty Borgia socialism. The feudal aristocracy was not the only class that was run by the bourgeois and not the only class whose conditions of existence pine and perish in the atmosphere of modern bourgeois society. The medieval burgesses and the small peasant proprietors were the precursors of the modern bourgeoisie. In those countries which are but little developed industrially and commercially, these two classes still vegetate side by side with the rising bourgeoisie. In countries where modern civilization has become fully developed, a new class of petty bourgeois has been formed, fluctuating between proletariat and bourgeoisie and ever renewing itself as a supplementary part of bourgeois society. The individual members of this class, however, are being constantly hurled down to the proletariat by the action of competition as modern industry develops. They even see the moment approaching when they will completely disappear as an independent section of modern society to be replaced in manufacturers, agriculture and commerce by the Lugers, Bailiff and Shopman. In countries like France, where the peasants constitute for more than half of the population, it was natural that writers who sided with the proletariat against the bourgeoisie should use in their criticism of the bourgeoisie on the standard of the peasant and petty bourgeoisie, and from the standpoint of his intermediate classes, should take up the cudgels for the working class. This arose petty bourgeois socialism. This is money, the head of the shul, not only in France, but also in England. This shul socialism dissected with great nakedness the contradictions in the conditions of modern production. It laid bare the hypocritical apologies of economists. It proved incontrovertibly the disastrous effects of machinery and division of Lobar, the concentration of capital and land in a few hands, overproduction and crisis. It pointed out the inevitable reign of the petty bourgeois and peasant, the misery of the proletariat, the anarchy in production, the crying inequalities in the distribution of wealth, the industrial war of extermination between nations, the dissolution of old moral bonds of the old family relations of the old nationalities.
In its post-Nazi AMS, however, this form of socialism aspires either to restoring the old means of production and of exchange and within the old property relations and the old society, or to cramping the modern means of production and of exchange within the framework of the old property relations that have been and were bound to be exploded by those means. In either case, it is both reactionary and utopian. Its last words are corporate goals for manufacture, cure, putri or trial relations in agriculture. Ultimately, when stubborn historical facts had dispersed all intoxicating effects of self-deception, this form of socialism ended in a miserable fit of the blues. She German or true socialism? The socialist and communist literature affronts a literature that originated under the pressure of a bourgeoisie and power, and that was the expressions of the struggle against this power. It was introduced into Germany at a time when the bourgeoisie in that country had just begun its cons with feudal absolutism. German philosophers would be philosophers and be experts eagerly seized on this literature, only forgetting that when these writings immigrated from France into Germany, French social conditions had not immigrated along with them. In contact with German social conditions, this French literature lost all its immediate practical significance and assumed a purely literary aspect. Thus, to the German philosophers of the 19th century, the demands of the first French Revolution were nothing more than the demands of practical reason in general, and the utterance of the will of the revolutionary French bourgeoisie signified. In their eyes, the laws of pure will, a will as it was bound to be, of true human will generally. The work of the German literary consisted solely in bringing the new French ideas into harmony with their ancient philosophical conscience, or rather in annexing the French ideas without deserting their own philosophic point of view. This annexation took place in the same way in which a foreign language is appropriated, namely by translation. It is well known how the monks wrote silly lives of Catholic saints over the manuscripts on which the classical works of ancient heathendom had been written. The German literary reversed this process with the profane French literature. They wrote their philosophical nonsense beneath the French original. For instance, beneath the French criticism of the economic functions of money, they wrote alienation of humanity, and beneath the French criticism of the Borsche state, they wrote dethronement of the category of the general, and so forth. The introduction of these philosophical phrases at the back of the French historical criticisms, the dubbed philosophy of action, true socialism, German scenes of socialism, philosophical foundation of socialism, and so on. The French socialist and communist literature was thus completely emasculated, and since it ceased in the hands of the German to express the struggle of one class with the other, he felt conscious of having overcome French homicidiness and of representing not true requirements, but the requirements of truth, not the interest of the proletariat, but the interest of human nature, but men in general, who belongs to no class, is no reality, which is only in the misty realm of philosophical fantasy. This German socialism, which took its two-boy task seriously and solemnly, and extolled its poor stock in trade in such a mountebank fashion, meanwhile gravely lost its pedantic innocence. The fight of the Germans, and especially the Prussian bourgeoisie, against the feudal aristocracy and absolute monarchy. In other words, the liberal movement became more earnest. By this, the long list for opportunity was offered to true socialism, confronting the political movement with the socialist demands of foreign the traditional anathemas against liberalism, against representative government. Against Borsch with competition, Borsch with freedom of the press, Borsch with legislation, Borsch with liberty and equality, and of preaching to the masses that they had nothing to gain and everything lost by this Borsch with movement. German socialism forgot in the nick of time that the French criticism, Hosili Chu at West, presupposed the existence of modern Borsch with society, with its corresponding economic conditions of existence, and the political constitution adapted there to the very things those attainment was the object of the pending struggle in Germany. To the absolute governments with their fallen of persons, professors, country squares, and officials, it served as a welcome scarecrow against the threatening bourgeoisie. It was a sweet finish after the better pulls of flogging and bullets with which these same governments, just at that time, as the German working class risings. While this true socialism served the government as a weapon for fighting the German bourgeoisie, it at the same time directly represented a reactionary interest, the interest of German Philistines. In Germany, the petty bourgeois class, a relic of the 16th century, and since then constantly cropping up again under the various forms, is the real social basis of the existing state of things. To preserve this class is to preserve the existing state of things in Germany. The industrial and political supremacy of the bourgeoisie threatens it with certain destruction, on the one hand from the concentration of capital, on the other from the rise of a revolutionary proletariat. True socialism appeared to kill these two birds with one stone. 
It spread like an epidemic. A rub of speculative kabobs, embroidered with flowers rhetoric, steeped in the deal of cyclic sentiment. This transcendental rub in which the German socialists wrap their sorry traps, all skin and bones, served to wonderfully and raise the cell of their gods amongst such a public. And on its part, German socialism recognized more and more its own calling as the bombastic representative of Penny Borsu Philistin. It proclaimed the German nation to be the mogul nation and the German Penny Philistin to be the typical man. To the approval and house menace of this mogul man, it gave a head and higher socialistic interpretation, the exact contrary of its real character. It one of these from length of directly opposing the brutally destructive tendency of communism and of proclaiming its supreme and impartial contempt of all class struggles. With very few exceptions, all the so-called socialist and communist publications that now show 1847 circulate in Germany belong to the domain of this fall of innervating literature. Part 2 Conservative or Borgia Socialism A part of the bourgeoisie is desirous of redressing social grievances in order to secure the continued distance of bourgeois society. To this section belong economists, philanthropists, humanitarians, improvers of the condition of the working class, organizers of charity, members of societies for prevention of cruelty to animals, temperance fanatics, all in the corner reformers of every imaginable kind. This form of socialism has moreover been worked out into complete systems. We may cite province philosophy de la misere as an example of this form. The socialistic bourgeois won all the advantages of modern social conditions without the struggles and dangers necessarily resulting therefrom. They deserve the existing state of society, menace its revolutionary and disintegrating elements. They watch for a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. The bourgeoisie naturally conceives the world in which it is supreme to be the best, and bourgeois socialism develops its comfortable conception into various more or less complete systems, and recurring the proletariat to carry out such a system, and thereby to march straightway into the social New Jerusalem, it but requires in reality that the proletariat shall remain within the bonds of existing society, but should cast away all its hateful ideas concerning the bourgeoisie. A second, more practical but less systematic form of the socialist of to depreciate every revolutionary movement in the eyes of the working class by showing that no mere political reform, but only a change in the material conditions of existence in economical relations could be of any advantage to them. By changes in the material conditions of existence, this form of socialism, however, by no means understands abolition of the bourgeois relations of production. An abolition that can be affected only by a revolution, but administrative reforms based on the continued existence of these relations. Reforms, therefore, that in no respect affect the relations between capital and Lobar, but at the best lessen the cost and simplify the administrative work of bourgeois government. Bourgeois socialism, that means I declare expression when only when it becomes a mere figure of speech. Free credit for the benefit of the working class. Protective duties for the benefit of the working class. Present reform for the benefit of the working class. This is the last word and the only seriously meant word of bourgeois socialism. It is summed up in the phrase that the bourgeois is a bourgeois for the benefit of the working class. Part three, critical utopian socialism and communism. We do not hear refer to that literature which in every great modern revolution has always given voice to the demands of the proletariat such as the raisings of the buff and others. The first direct attempts of the proletariat to attain its own ends made in times of universal excitement when feudal society was being overthrown necessarily failed all into the then undeveloped state of the proletariat as well as to the absence of the economic conditions for its emancipation. Conditions that had it been produced and could be produced by the impending Morsuit Pochon. The revolutionary literature that accompanied these first movements of the proletariat had necessarily a reactionary character. It inculcated universal asceticism and social leveling in its crudest form. The socialist and communist systems, properly so called, those of St. Simon, Farrier, Owen, and others, spring into existence in the early and developed period described above of the struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie. See Section 1. The bourgeois and proletarians, the founders of these systems, see indeed the class and veganism as well as the action of the decomposing elements in the prevailing form of South City. That the proletariat, as yet in its infancy, offers to them the spectacle of a class without any historical initiative or any independent political movement.
Since the development of class, antagonists keep even pace with the development of industry. The economic situation, as they find it, does not as it offer to them the natural conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. They therefore search after a new social scenes, after new social laws that are to create these conditions. Historical action is to yield to their personal inventive action. Historically created conditions of emancipation, fantastic ones. And the great will spontaneous class organization of the proletariat to an organization of society especially contrived by these inventors. Future history resolves itself in their eyes into the propaganda and the practical carrying out of their social plans. In the formation of their plans, they are conscious of carrying shift life for the interest of the working class as being the most suffering class. Only from the point of view of being the most suffering class does the proletariat exist through the undeveloped state of the class struggle, as well as their own surroundings, causes socialists of this kind to consider themselves the superior to all class antagonisms. They want to improve the condition of every member of society, even that of the most favored. Since they habitually appeal to society at large without the distinction of class, nay, by preference to the ruling class, or how can people, when once they understand their system, fail to see in it the best possible plan of the best possible state of society? Hence, they reject all political and especially all revolutionary action. They wish to attain their ends by peaceful means, necessarily doomed to failure and by the force of example, to pave the way for the new social gospel. Such fantastic pictures of future society, candidate, at a time when the proletariat is still in a very undeveloped state and has but a fantastic conception of its own position correspond with the first instinctive yearnings of that class for a general reconstruction of society. But these socialist and communist publications contain also a critical element. They lack every principle of existing society. Hence, they are full of the most valuable materials for the enlightenment of the working class. The practical measures proposed in them, such as the abolition of the distinction between town and country of the family, of the carrying on of industries for the account of private individuals under the wage system, the proclamation of social harmony, the conversion of the function of the state into a more superintendence of production. All these proposals point solely to the disappearance of class and antagonists, which were at that time only just cropping up, and which in these publications are recognized in their early indistinct and, and unfined forms only. These proposals, therefore, are of a purely utopian character. The significance of critical utopian socialism and communism bears an inverse relation to historical development. In proportion as the modern class struggle develops and takes definite shape, this fantastic standing apart from the consciousness, these fantastic attacks on it lose all practical volume and all theoretical justification. Therefore, all three of the originators of these systems, where in many respects revolutionary, their disciples have in every case formed erectionary sects. They hold fast by the original vibes of their masters in opposition to the progressive historical development of the proletariat. They therefore in Devar, and that consistently to de in the class struggle and to reconcile the class antagonisms. They still dream of experimental realization of their social utopies, of founding isolated fallensters, of establishing home colonies, or setting up a little to carry of new dissimilar editions of the New Jerusalem, and to realize all these castles in the air. They are compelled to appeal to the feelings and purses of the bourgeois. By degrees, they sink into the category of the reactionary or conservative socialist depicted above. Differing from this only by a more systematic pedantry and by their fanatical and superstitious belief in the miraculous effects of their social scenes. They, therefore, violently oppose all political action on the part of the working class. Such action, according to them, can only result from blind unbelief in the new gospel. The Onyps in England and the Forers in France, respectively, oppose the Chartists and the Reformists. Chapter 4 Position of the Communists in Relation to the Various Existing Opposition Parties. Section 2 has made clear relations of the commons to the existing working class parties, such as the Chartists in England and the Iran reformers in America. The communists fight for the attainment of the immediate ends, for the enforcement of the momentary interests of the working class. But in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement. In France, the communists ally with the social democrats against the conservative and radical bourgeoisie. They're surveying, however, the right to take up a critical position in regard to cases and illusions traditionally handed down from the Great Revolution. In Switzerland, they support the radicals without losing sight of the fact that this party consists of antagonistic elements, partly of democratic socialists in the French sense, partly of radical bourgeois.
in Poland, they support the party that insists on an agrarian revolution as the prime condition for national emancipation, that party which fomented the insurrection of Krakow in 1846. In Germany, they fight with the Borsalsi whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy, the feeble scararchy, and the petty Borsalsi. But they never cease for a single instant to instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between Borsalsi and proletariat in order that the German workers may straightway use as so many weapons against the bourgeoisie. The social and political conditions that the bourgeoisie must necessarily introduce along with its supremacy, in order that, after the fall of the reactionary classes in Germany, the fight against the bourgeoisie itself may immediately begin. The communists turned their attention to flying to Germany, because the country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of Europe and civilization, and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th in France in the 18th century, and because the bourgeois revolution in Germany, but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. In short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. In all these movements, they bring to the front as the leading question in each of the property question, no matter what its degree of development at the time. Finally, they labor everywhere for the union and agreement of the democratic parties of all countries. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. But the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Workingmen of all countries unite.